Oh, what a joy it is to be with you once again on this most glorious of Sabbaths. The sun is shining, the corn is growing, things are good. Amen? Amen. We're going to jump with both feet into our message today. How many of you got your homework done? How many of you even remember you had homework? How many forgot? <laughs> We are going to jump right into Acts 15, where we have this rare opportunity to peer through the window at the very first church business meeting. Now, we already, a few weeks ago, we were present and kind of looked through the window at the first church service, and now we get to look at the first church business meeting, where they just happen to be dealing with what we've already been talking about, this tension that exists between the truth and accountability of the gospel and the grace and forgiveness of the gospel. Okay, now let me just remind you, the text we're getting ready to read is a little bit PG-13-ish. Remember I said that last week? Uh, but it's important information. Uh, it's in the Bible. So we're going to look at it. And there will be parts of this story that may make you uncomfortable. But I would suggest uncomfortable can be good. Because uncomfortable can be a catalyst towards deeper understanding. Okay? Before we jump in, let's pray. God, we humble ourselves before you. We ask that as we open your word, may it be your voice we hear. May you speak into the hearts of each person hearing this message now. May you give them something that will add meat and muscle to their spiritual bones. May I also grow and be transformed by hearing your word. In Jesus' name, amen. And so what you may have discovered, those of you who did your homework, you already know, um, we're about to discover what is so weird, so unbelievable about what the thing was, the thing that tripped up the early church so early in their development. It's incredible. Now that I have your attention, Acts 15, hold on to your seats, here we go. Some men came down from Judea and Antioch, to Antioch, and were teaching the brothers. So you've got these Jews that came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and here's the sermon that they're preaching to the brand new Christians. Reach out, grab a hold of the pew in front of you. Hold it tight. Go ahead. There you go. Here we go. Unless you're circumcised, according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. And the ladies go, so what? And the men go, what? <laughs> hold the phone. Unless I have surgery, I can't be a Christian. Hold on one spirit-filled moment. Somebody go get Paul. Where is Paul? Because I'm telling you right now, he left that part out. Where was that written? In teeny tiny print on the back of the scroll all the way at the bottom? Did I miss an asterisk? Nobody reads that stuff. What's going on here? And they would have responded by saying, but you're Gentiles. You, you can't be a Christian until you become Jewish. And you can't become Jewish unless you get, well, you know, when Jewish boys are about eight days old, they have to go off to the temple and they get, well, and you're a Gentile. So you didn't go to the temple when you were eight days old and get, well, it didn't happen for you. So if you're going to be saved, if you're going to be a Christian, you first have to become Jewish. And in order to become Jewish, well, guys, you need a surgery in order to be saved. So as you might imagine, 
the new believers class during this time was predominantly women and children. Because <laughs> the men are all out in the parking lot in the huddle going, I don't know about this. I love Jesus, brother. Honey, you go ahead. We're going to talk for a minute here. And it's weird, right? This is weird. I told you it would be uncomfortable. But uncomfortable is good if it serves as a catalyst to deeper understanding, which this most certainly will. So we need to think about this. Because this is what they really deeply believed. They really believed that before you could be embraced by the church, men, you had to become a member of the Moses Club before you become a member of the Jesus Club. That's what they believed. All right, let's move on. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. Well, duh. <laughs> Paul's going all over the Gentile world, preaching and teaching. It's simple. Resurrection, Jesus. Resurrection, Jesus. Just embrace Jesus and, and the church will embrace you. But... As so often happens, somebody didn't make it to the meeting. Somebody didn't check their email. And now they're teaching wrong facts. And I know this is difficult for you to believe that this could possibly happen, but there was miscommunication in the church. Aren't you glad that never happens in the church anymore? Aren't you glad that's the thing of the past? So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem. So Jerusalem was where this crazy, uncomfortable message got started. And so Paul and other believers are going to go back up to Jerusalem to sort this all out. Verse 2. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem. To see the apostles and elders about, well, this question. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. So Paul shows up and he says, all right, gather around. Listen, we got to have a staff parish meeting today. We need to talk. But before we do that... We need to do this. I need to give you my pastor's report. I need to share with you everything that God has been doing. Because I've been traveling all around and planting churches. And everywhere I go, the Gentiles are responding in a tremendous way. They are overwhelmingly, enthusiastically embracing the message of Jesus Christ. And when they embrace this message of Jesus Christ, miraculous, tremendous things are happening. And we're starting churches everywhere. But when I'm teaching them, my message has been resurrection Jesus Resurrection Jesus, not resurrection Jesus circumcision. I have not been telling them they need surgery to get salvation. I have not been telling them, to put it in maybe our terms, I have not been telling them they need to straighten their life out first. I've not been telling them, here are some things you need to stop saying, stop doing, stop going. I've not been saying, here, you know, you got to take these six weeks worth of classes and then fill out this form. And then if everything looks right, maybe we'll welcome you in and you can be a church person. Paul says, I, I haven't been saying any of that. And this is where we realize the significance of it because Paul's saying we're sending out a mixed message to the Gentiles. And we have to sort this out. If we don't sort this out, all those thousands of people, all those Gentiles, they're going to get confused. They're going to get frustrated. And they may leave the church altogether. Guys, we've got to figure this out. And that was Paul's pastor's report, which sounds great, but then they convened the staff parish meeting, so to speak. And here's the way that committee responded, verse 5. 
Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, dramatic pause, did you catch it? Who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, you're going, wait, whoa, whoa, you're telling me there were Pharisees who followed Jesus? Yeah, you should really read your Bible. There's some amazing stuff in there. The Pharisees, the ones who had Jesus crucified and hung on the cross, the Pharisees who were the recurring bad guys in the life story of Jesus Christ. When Jesus rose from the dead, this was such a powerful moment that even Pharisees started to believe in the one whom they crucified. Which is great. It's tremendous. It's wonderful. But again, like we said next last week, like we said next week, that'd be a trick. Like we said last week, when the Jewish people became, and the Pharisees became followers of Jesus, remember, they brought with them all the rules and regulations and traditions that they had been taught since they were little kids. Right? So what they're struggling with is this whole idea of, yeah, we believe Jesus died for everyone. We get that. What we don't get is how they don't have to act like us in order to be one of us. Does that hit home a little bit for us? Still verse 5. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. Now, I don't know. I wasn't there. I don't know the tone that they used at that point. But something tells me it was a fairly drill instructor-like stern tone. And what complicates this and what makes it difficult for us to understand sometimes is the fact that, well... <laughs> We're Gentiles. And Gentiles like us have no idea what they're really talking about. I mean, we get the surgery part, but it's the law part, right? Because when we hear the law, we immediately think what? We think the Ten Commandments. But that's not what they're referring to here. The Pharisees are talking about those 600 plus laws that they were taught since they were little kids that were required for you to be right with God. But that's not what Scripture would tell us. So what, what basically what these Pharisees and, and these new Jewish converts are saying to Paul, they're saying, Paul, listen, we want you to go back. Go back to all those cities, all those churches that you just planted, and we want you to retrain, reteach, reeducate all of those new believers on how they must restructure their entire life based on these 600 plus rules that we believe in. And Paul, listen, we want you to know we love you, buddy. We're not cold hearted. We really want to help. So we've prepared this six week sermon series that you can use to help educate the new believers. Here it is 600 ways you need to change to be a church person. Here it is. Take it with you. And we know, listen, Paul, we know you're the preacher. We're just trying to help. And then, of course, and Paul. Once you've re-educated them and once they've had that surgery and once they become good enough, why then we'll welcome them into the church with arms wide open. And we hear this and we can't help but think how incredibly absurd that sounds, right? Who in their right mind would make it so incredibly difficult for those people who very simply want to embrace Jesus. Who in their right mind would make it so incredibly difficult for those who, who would stand and dare be a gatekeeper to the church of Jesus Christ? And 
the answer is you might. You might. All of us, myself included, are capable. See, if you've been in church for years and years and years, this kind of thinking just naturally creeps its way in to your mind. And it does not, please hear me, that does not make you a bad person. That makes you a human person. We just naturally think we're so open-minded, we're so accepting, but every once in a while, you'll be in church or maybe you'll be at home and one of your kids brings a new friend home from school and they said, Mom, Dad, this is so-and-so and and they're in my class and and they go to uh, so-and-so church down the street. Maybe you don't say it out loud, but in the back of your mind, you might be thinking, oh, really? You're telling me She goes to church. She don't look like any church person I ever saw. You're telling me he goes to church. Why is his hair so long? Is that a tattoo? What music does he listen to? And if we're not really, really careful, what happens is we settle into our version of Christianity. And when we run into people who don't meet our version of Christianity, suddenly we become uncomfortable, and uncomfortable leads to judgmental, and judgmental means we have accidentally drifted into becoming a modern-day Pharisee. That's what we're reading about in this story from thousands and thousands of years ago. Now, I, there's so much here, I don't have time to unpack everything, so I'm, I'm encouraging you, inviting you to, to reread the rest of the story if you've not read it yet. There's so much here that applies to our lives today, but we need to, to jump to the end of Peter's sermon. And at the end of Peter's sermon, I love talking about James. I love hearing what the brother of Jesus has to say. Every time I wonder, what would my brother have had to do to convince me he was the brother of Jesus, that he was the son of God? I said, you know what I meant to say, right? I may not have said what I meant to say, but you know what I meant to say, even though I didn't say it. So when James speaks, he gets my attention. And at the end of Peter's sermon, James stands up and he makes this powerful statement. Verse 19, it is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Isn't that beautiful? He says, listen, I've been sitting here this whole meeting. I've heard the debate. I've heard the discussion. I know we have moral standards. I know Jesus is all about grace and forgiveness and mercy. And I know that creates a tension between the the truth and accountability of the gospel and the grace and forgiveness of the gospel. But brothers and sisters, this is a tension to be navigated, not eliminated. Because ministry is messy and we need to learn how to march towards the mess, not flee from it. And I know, I know it's confusing, but if we want to keep this Jesus message alive, if we want to keep it spreading, we should not make it difficult for people who are turning to God. We should not make it difficult for people who are turning to God. Anything that serves as a roadblock to people who are turning to God, if at all possible, we need to remove it. We need to do everything short of sin to bring them in. Let me remind you of something you already know. The gospel is all about turning people to God. It's about introducing people to Jesus. It's people first, then paperwork. It's relationships first, and then rules. It's about outreach and who's not here yet. It's reaching the unreached, convincing the unconvinced, loving the unloved, caring for everyone. 
It's remembering that heaven and hell are real. And real people go there every day. Everyone lives forever somewhere. And we know, we know, Jesus is the answer. And there may be people within your circle of influence, and you may be the only church person they know. You have the answer to everything that's destroying the world around them. The answer is Jesus. So how are we doing? How are we doing about helping people find their way to Jesus? We should not make it difficult for those who are turning to God. So let me share with you Jesus' brother. His name is James, in case I didn't mention that. Here's his tension management proposal. Here's what he said, verse 20. We should write to them, talking about the new Gentile uh, brothers and sisters. We should write to them, telling them, and it's at this point, you've been in a meeting where this happens. It's at this point in the meeting that everyone who was in the meeting listening, when he says that, everybody goes, Everybody leaned forward, made eye contact with him, and here's what he said. We should tell them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. And that's when many of them who were doing this did this. And then they probably did this. And they said, wait. Did you just take 600 laws plus the Ten Commandments and reduce them all the way down to don't offend the Jews and avoid sexual immorality? Did you just do that? Paul, James, what about lying and, and cheating? And, and what about my neighbor whose sheep keeps coming in my yard and doing his business and he won't do anything? What, what, what about... James says... Let's not burden them with that just yet. For now, let's just tell them, try not to offend the Jews because that meat thing is, is really troublesome for them and abstain from sexual immorality. That's it. If, if we can do that, if we can all do that, then we can all be part of the church together in unity. We can hold our arms open to one another and say, welcome to the family. Then we can sing, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. <laughs> so next, James says, here's the plan. We write a letter. They send the letter with some guys down to the church of Antioch. They walk into the church, letter in hand, and a hush falls across the room. Imagine the letters being carried in from somebody in the back, and they make their way down. Front. They come up here and stand behind the microphone and start unfolding the letter. And everybody's like, oh, this is it. We're about to find out what's going to happen. The men are all huddled in the corner going, surgery? No surgery. Come on, no surgery. Finally, they read the letter. And after they read the letter, verse 31 says this. And there was great joy. Well, yeah, there was. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And there was great joy throughout the church that day as they read this encouraging message. Yeah, I would imagine there was this collective manly sigh of relief heard across the land. They had just dodged the first potential church split. What was the tension? Law versus love. Rules versus regulation or relationships. Now again, there's a lot more to this story than we have time for. So read it. Please, please, please read it. But, but I want to just leave you with this. 
The drift or the shift? Let me define the two terms. The drift or the shift? Drift, we define this way. The accidental, gradual, coasting off course. Drift is accidental, detrimental. Uh-oh, but it's comfortable. It's detrimental, but it's comfortable. Shift, on the other hand, is slamming the clutch to the floorboard, shifting into high gear, speeding into the right direction with right intention and purpose. Shift is intentional, beneficial, ah, but it's uncomfortable. Over the years, I've discovered what you might call the drift towards insiders. In other words, every local church, not just this church, but all local churches naturally drift towards an insider-focused existence. Insiders, those who are already here, those who already know when to stand and when to sit. They already know the doxology without the words on the screen. They already know how to park and what time to get here to get the back row. The insiders, the one paying the bills, the one volunteering, the one keeping the gears moving, the insiders. Now, let me tell you this profound, deep, earth-shattering truth I discovered this week. Are you ready? I have discovered that those who do not attend here do not complain here. Profound, right? Maybe not at first listen, but listen. Outsiders, people who do not attend here, do not complain here. In other words, I've never had someone who does not attend here call here and complain about what's happening here. People who do not attend here have never called and said, yeah, uh, listen, that sermon, whew, way too long. Those hymns, wow, way outdated. It, it, it's 2021. Come on now. People who do not attend here do not complain here, which is why this is so important. This is why it's so very easy without our even realizing it. We just naturally drift towards insider-focused behavior. Because outsiders have no voice inside the church. Unless. Unless some fired up Jesus followers decide that they're willing to let go of what they knew in order to try something new. And they're willing to slam the clutch to the floorboard, shift into high gear, and charge forward into an outward-focused, mission-centered existence. Now, we have to remember, we said shift is purposeful, beneficial, but it's also what? It's uncomfortable. So missional Christians have to learn and develop this skill of being comfortably uncomfortable. I'd love to have you share with me sometime what image popped into your mind when you heard those two words. Comfortably uncomfortable. We have to accept the challenge of ensuring outsiders have a voice inside the church. We have to be intentionally focused on outsiders. And again, this thought... Of, of accidentally becoming insider-focused. It's understandable, but it's avoidable, okay? Quickly, let me, let me run through the second drift because it is even more insidious than the first. Here it is. This is the drift towards preserving rather than progressing. A shift towards preserving rather than progressing. And what's so insidious about this particular shift is that it is so very subtle. 
Because in the beginning, we all start out passionate about progress. In fact, I've never met a single business owner, uh, somebody that starts a new company or a new business. They never start it with the intention of maintaining mediocrity and preserving the status quo. I've never read that in a new business mission statement, right? We are going to maintain status quo. We will maintain mediocrity at all costs. Sign here. It's so subtle. In fact, I would suggest to you that our natural tendency would be like what the Jews did. They were intent on preserving. They looked around and said, we've got a lot to lose. We better preserve. Preserve, preserve. We better preserve the law. We better preserve the temple. We better preserve our way of doing things the way we've always done things. We better pre preserve our standing in the community, our power, our influence. We cannot allow everything, we've, everything we knew to be erased by something new. Preserve, preserve, preserve. And in their sincere effort to preserve what they knew, they missed the new. In their efforts to preserve something good, they failed to advance the kingdom of God. So Jesus came along and he said, all those other things are okay. It's not that they're not important, but we will advance the kingdom of God. And yes, it may bring us into situations that are uncomfortable, which simply means we have to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Or as one evangelist said, can, imagine if this were my first sentence to you from the pulpit as your new pastor. I have come to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comforted. Amen, let's go home. We avoid the drift towards mere preservation, maintaining status quo, by being intentionally missional focused. Intentional discipleship is what we're talking about, right? This mission of progression. We're going to try new things. We're going to try new ways of doing old things. We're going to have a VBS that's going to knock our kids' socks off. And we're going to try some things we haven't tried before. And we're going to work hard. And we're going to make a train out of cardboard. That cannot be easy. <laughs> but whatever we do, we will not allow our desire to preserve, override our mission to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. That comes first. So... Let me just quickly, and we're, we're very close to done. Uh, I want to give you my standard operating philosophy, and I'm just going to give you these bullet points, and then we'll pray. Because it isn't about us. Right? It's about a world that doesn't know Jesus. It's about your children or your grandchildren who haven't yet figured out the whole Jesus thing. It's about people right here in our city, our county, who have been hurt by the church. So I just want to leave you again with these three commitments. We want to skip the drift and grip the shift. Number one, we have to be bold. We already covered that. Say something when it would be easier to say nothing. Second, we need to err on the side of grace. If we're going to err on one side or the other, err on the side of grace. Are you not thankful that God erred on the side of grace when it came to your relationship with him? Are you not thankful he erred on the side of grace as opposed to saying, yeah, I know you're sorry, and here's a list of 600 things you need to do, and then come and see me, we'll, th we'll talk about it. Err on the side of grace. And last, we want to be open-handed. Open-handed. 
We're not going to try to hold on to anything, but we're not going to let go of anything. We're just going to be open-handed and let God give and take as he sees fit. And we're going to remember those moments when, when, when God was gracious to us, when maybe, maybe he said to you, you know, I, I saw you and I heard you. I saw you look at those pills. I saw you look at that alcohol. And I saw you struggle and struggle and struggle. And I heard you cry out to me. And I understand. God says, I loved you when it was a temptation issue long before it was a habit issue. We will not make it hard for those who are turning to God. I got another 40 minutes, but perhaps we should stop. Our Father in heaven, we have, we have covered a lot of ground today. and I very humbly, respectfully ask that Something that was said today, again, that it would serve to be, to give increased muscle to our spiritual bones. That everyone would, would walk away from this worship hour with a newfound sense of purpose, with an increased sense of courage and inspiration and power to walk with you to face the challenges that will hit us first thing Monday morning. May something stick to our spiritual bones that will carry us through the week and not just fizzle away as soon as we leave the church property. Thank you for reminding us that you are our strength and our salvation. Thank you for reminding us that we are never alone. In Jesus' name we pray.